Keith Shadbolt is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of startup SciQuantum. SciQuantum is building a large-scale, general-purpose, silicon photonic quantum computer. And we're going to talk about some of the manufacturing challenges and political and funding hurdles that Quantum will need to overcome to become a reality. Pete, welcome. It's great to have you with us today. Hey, Amit. How are you doing? Great to see you. Thank you. So, Pete, we, I mentioned the path to reality. What are the critical steps along this quantum computing path to reality? Yeah, so, um, you know, I think the, the, the reality with all um, approaches to quantum computing is that they're coming out of university research groups. You know, quantum computing has this association with crazy materials, atomic scale fabrication, millikelvin temperatures, you know, these kind of science fiction like um, devices and uh, operating environments. And those inevitably start out somewhere in a university. And, you know, we're no different. We spent um, 15 some years in the university in the UK building and testing small quantum computers. That was a fantastic time for me. You know, you were we were taking single photons and putting them into silicon chips really for the first time. And you know that the sort of thing that kept me up at night at that at that point was you know what's going to happen are these photons going to behave themselves can we entangle them is there going to be some crazy physics all the time we understood something that's been understood about quantum computing for 20 some years which is that ultimately you're going to need error correction and therefore you're going to need millions of qubits if you want to deliver on the you know tremendously exciting commercially valuable applications that uh, you know we're all we're all excited about, and you know when I was in the university there was sort of a wave of enthusiasm for the idea that you might get something done with a small quantum computer. You mentioned quantum supremacy, and you know there was a period of time I think where people were optimistic that you might run commercially valuable applications without error correction. But I think that time is coming to an end and people are recognizing again that we need something that is so much larger and so much mature, more mature than the small, small scale experiments that we have today. And so when we founded the company, it was with the understanding that, yes, you need a million qubits. Yes, you need error correction. And of course, you know, that can be a pretty daunting prospect and um, certainly if you are building it the same way you would build a science experiment that's going to take you a you know, very, very long time to build a system like that. I think the, the idea that you know, we've been um, strong proponents of for a long time has been that, of course, a million is a big number and certainly for a scientist, like it's a big, scary number. But there is an industry, the semiconductor industry, which has been the beneficiary of a trillion dollars of investment over the last 50 years or so that routinely works, you know, a miracle of putting a billion transistors in your pocket. And so our approach has been to say, we need to take this, you know, crazy science fiction technology of quantum computing, and we need to figure out how to leverage the tools and the manufacturing processes that um, allow us to build, you know, very, very large numbers of devices uh, for our conventional electronics. Um, if we want to have any hope of delivering on the promise of of quantum computing, you know, in my lifetime, really. Um, so, uh, yeah, for us, the, the journey has been very much about getting out of the mode of science experiments and building hardware that is at, at a different level of maturity. Um, does that does that make sense, Simon? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And there are lots of different ways to build a quantum computer, as you hinted at, you know, from superconducting to photonic to, you know, diamond-based to NMR and hundreds of different types that we don't really have time to get into today. And the favoured approaches have changed over the years. Do you think the field as a whole is crystallising around this idea that you talked about, that these devices need to mesh well with existing production lines, with existing technology, if they're ever going to be practically useful? Yeah, that's right. So um, you're absolutely right. There's a ton of different ways to build qubits um, using all sorts of different exotic pieces of physics. And I've worked on a couple of them myself. And it can be really confusing, right? And of course, everybody wants to know which is the best qubit. 
Uh, and the reality is that um, uh, you can, you know, of course, go and compare these qubits and look at the various pros and cons. In fact, I would say that today everybody can build a qubit and those qubits are just fine. You know, whether it's superconducting qubits, quantum dots, uh, uh, or photons as, as we use, everybody is successfully building small systems of qubits. And there's nothing really wrong with them. They're, they're fine. You know, we can argue about the pros and cons. I think what to your to your question about you know the shift in 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 the industry, what you're seeing is people you know getting over that initial proof of principle and starting to really take seriously the question of you know how are we going to get to scale, and in that context, you can see very profound differentiation between these different techn technology logical approaches. And it's not really about, you know, the usual characteristics that we think of. What's the coherence time of the qubit? What's the, you know, single qubit gate fidelity or two qubit gate fidelity? It's much more about, yeah, these um, less quantum characteristics like manufacturability, you know, cooling capacity, control electronics, uh, connectivity between qubits. There's nothing particularly quantum about these things, but these are the you know, scaling obstacles that really stand in the way of a big system. And that's where you can clearly see differentiation between the technologies, I would say. Those things are all very expensive to implement. You know, you talked about these uh, silicon factories where they uh, punch out transistors. They cost huge amounts of money to build. What's the funding environment like for quantum at the moment? And do VCs understand that this is a long-term 10 or 20 or 50-year proposition and not something that they're likely to see a return on in the very short term? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. So, um, uh, you're absolutely right. You know, you, you can't build a million qubit fault tolerant, uh, quantum computer on a shoestring. And, um, you know, I think again, there was some hope that we would, uh, access commercially valuable applications on a shoestring in this NISC regime. And the jury is still out. That's still absolutely possible, but yeah, people are starting to recognize this is a this is a big project uh, to get it done. We've been very fortunate uh, to uh, raise a lot of money, and um, you know we're in a very priv privileged and uh, uh, very privileged position. And there's a lot of responsibility associated with that. Uh, but what that's allowed us to do, as you mentioned, is to go to um, a you know one of the very few high volume chip manufacturing uh, facilities on the planet, namely Global Foundries. And we're now able to build chips in that production line. And that's not cheap, <laughs> you know, relative to the experiments that I would do in the university, um, but it's paying off in, in a huge way as we see the reliability and the performance of these device, devices that we can uniquely access in those manufacturing lines. And so, yeah, we, we, we of course, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm talking to, uh, to investors on a, on a, well, I have been talking to investors on a regular basis over the last few years. And it's very, very encouraging, actually, the level of sophistication and appreciation that these guys have for the need for something that goes beyond a kind of MVP, proof of principle type system. Um, so, yeah, we've been very encouraged and, of course, very fortunate in that. There's also a political angle to this, right? Not in terms, not just in terms of manufacturing uh, transistors and, and, and chips, but also in terms of the research and, you know, the prospect of one country maybe racing ahead with seeing China pouring billions into this, the EU is pouring billions into it, the US is pouring billions into it. What will it mean from a geopolitical perspective if one country kind of reaches the quantum peak first or, you know, develops a technology that means that it can crack another country's encryption algorithms or can communicate without being spied on? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the sort of example that I would point to is the semiconductor industry, which we of course deal with a lot. And in fact, recent news has made this more apparent than ever. You know, we live in a really bizarre world where there are basically only three tier one semiconductor foundries that build the advanced chips that goes in, go into our laptops and cell phones. Those are TSMC, Global Foundries, and Samsung. You know, Intel is a kind of a special case. But it's not like there's hundreds of companies or hundreds of factories that can build these advanced chips. And so the location around the world of those facilities is very important. 
and we're also seeing, um, you know, uh, uh, right now a, a, a huge problem with that global semiconductor device supply chain that means that people are literally shutting down uh, automotive production lines and stopping building cars, right? So, you know, quantum computing, I think, is is going in a similar direction. It's, it's of course, a very capital intensive uh, and, you know, um, challenging technology to, to implement. And I think it's really important that we are, con you know, conscious and careful about uh, you know, making sure that this technology is deployed in a in a in a sort of um, thoughtful fashion, globally speaking. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a serious um, serious prospect. One of the big challenges that a lot of um, researchers in this field have had to grapple with, even in those small scale experiences, is this increasing level of noise as you scale up. Can you tell me a bit about how SciQuantum is dealing with that? You know, if you want to build a million qubit uh, quantum computer in a semiconductor factory. How do you make sure that it is not just undone by the noise that's coming off all these chips? Yeah, so um, the transistors in your cell phone have an error rate, something like 10 to the minus 15. So that's naught point naught followed by 15 noughts with a one after it, right? So they basically never have an error. And that's why your phone works reliably for years. Um, the Qubits, on the other hand, even our qubits, which we like very much, are still noisy, as you state. And, and you, the, the error rate that you're going to get is something like a fraction of a percent, realistically, from pretty much all approaches. And so if your you know, devices are going wrong uh, one in a few hundred times, maybe one in a few thousand times if you're lucky, the chance that you can run the billions of gates that we require for commercially valuable applications is nil. Right, these things basically are swamped by noise within 10 or 100 operations or so in, in existing systems. And so there's kind of two approaches to solving that. One of them is to try to reduce that error rate a little bit and come up with really smart algorithms that allow you to get things done you know, before the machine falls over. And that's what people refer to as uh, NISC or near-term intermediate scale quantum. Now maybe we can find some super smart algorithm that's going to give us an answer before the machine was killed by, by these errors. Nobody's been successful in doing that yet. You know, I've worked on these types of problems and it's very challenging. What we're doing is really the kind of vanilla approach that has been understood you know, for, for uh, more than a decade, which is to do error correction. So in your SSD and your laptop on this phone call that we have right now, there's digital error correction running to deal with all of the errors that are happening you know, between you and me uh, along this communication channel. And quantum error correction works pretty much the same way. You basically have uh, you know, a bunch of um, information carriers that are representing the uh, protected piece of information that you want. And if one of those goes wrong, you can kind of rely on the other ones uh, to, uh, to you know, keep that, that uh, that quantum information. So um, this is something that you know I think the whole industry is increasingly understanding that we're very likely to require error correction to do something worthwhile. And that's where this number of a million comes from is that the best known quantum error correcting codes today require you know very large num very large overhead, like a very large amount of redundancy basically um, in order for that error correcting code to work. So, um, uh, yeah, error correction really, as far as we're concerned, is the only way to build, you know, good enough qubits using these intrinsically noisy physical qubits that we, we expect to have, yeah. Given that, where do you think we'll be in five years or 10 years time? When do you think we'll see real life applications for quantum? Yeah. So again, there's you know there's still a there's still a chance that people will figure out a way to make these existing systems uh, useful. So, you know, it's a huge scientific milestone that Google now has machines that uh, win a race with a supercomputer. And that's an artificial race, but it's really showing the you know extreme power of a quantum computer. And it's absolutely conceivable that they'll figure out a way to do something useful and you know deliver on the promise 
with those types of systems. Um, and I think I, I alluded to this early on. Yeah, if you if you try to build a million qubits with a um, you know science experiment type of technology and a science experiment type of mentality, yeah, that's going to take you decades, right? Like when I was in the lab building these systems, if you'd come and said to me a million qubits, I would say, sure, give me a few decades and I'll get back to you. Obviously, you know we're optimistic that by leveraging the incredible capability that people have built in the semiconductor industry, we can do that much faster. We are right now building quantum chips in these tier one production lines. That's a huge milestone for us. Um, and so I think the sort of time frame that you describe is realistic. Of course, we're you know, being uh, very aggressive and there's a lot that can go wrong. Um, but I think that's realistic, yeah, to deliver um, uh, real, real commercially valuable applications. Right. We've got loads of questions from the audience. Thank you for sending those in. Um, so I'm going to jump into those right now. Um, we've got one about limiting okay. factors. What do you think the limiting factor is going to be for this transition to quantum? Is it going to be hardware? Is it going to be algorithms? Or is it going to be skills? That's a fantastic question. I think right now, um, you know, nobody has working hardware, right? You know, we're in this incredible position where there are small quantum systems and even high school students can sign into some uh, cloud provider and get access to a, a real quantum computer and run code on it. But that's very, very far from the big system that we ultimately require. So I would say this because we're building hardware, <laughs> but um, you know, I think, of course, we're not, we're not doing anything until we've got a working system and we have to acknowledge that that is a, is, a, is a big, big challenge to get that thing up and running. On the algorithms in the software side, I think it's very important to make a distinction between uh, algorithms and software. You can go on GitHub right now and I would claim that you can download software, programming languages, compilers, etc., that are actually completely adequate today to program a working quantum computer, like a world-changing scale system. The software is in pretty good shape, in fact. The algorithms, on the other hand, we only know of a couple of them that are useful, and it's a very deep and creative mathematical task to find new algorithms. It's not something where we can just turn the crank. And so, you know, I think that the world would benefit hugely uh, from more smart people thinking about that algorithm uh, discovery uh, activity. But again, that's not going to stop us, right? Really, the hardware is, is the missing component as far as I'm concerned, yeah. Another question from the audience. What kind of industries are you seeing interest in quantum from the most? You know, what, which industries, which organizations are investing in it the most? And are there any kind of surprising entities that are really in the quantum space that people might not expect? Yeah, so, um, you know, we now work with a number of customers across automotive, aerospace, finance, healthcare. And we're working with them basically to prepare them for the existence of the machine. I think what's been you know, surprising and exciting for me over the last 10 years of my career is to see how quickly these guys have got up to speed. You know, 10 years ago, talking to a car company about quantum computing would be a little bit farcical, right? And now these guys have hired quantum information experts and they're really smart and they're really organized about using this technology for whatever it is, battery chemistry, portfolio optimization, the usual suspects, right? And I think the other, you asked about surprises, the other surprise, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm a naturally kind of skeptical person. And very often we go and look at these use cases that potential customers are interested in. My tendency is to say, no, like this is not a good candidate for a quantum computer. You should just go use your regular computer for this one. Uh, this isn't in the, in the right domain. And I've been, you know, surprised and humbled a number of times when we actually go dig into these problems um, and realize, no, wow, there actually is a real argument for, you know, meaningful speed ups from a quantum computer in this in this uh, problem space. So, um, yeah, that's been really, really gratifying, surprising and exciting for me. Yeah. 